Welcome to the Grizzly Times podcast with Louisa Wilcox, a place devoted to all things grizzly, where we interview scientists, managers, Native Americans, and others about their perspectives and experience with bears and their ecosystems. This comes at a critical time in a complex debate about grizzly bears, with the recent restoration of endangered species safeguards for the Yellowstone bear, but a new proposal to strip protections for glaciers grizzlies, and when warming temperatures and development are transforming the bear's world. We hope that you find the information and views offered here useful as you shape your own conclusions. This is Louisa Wilcox with Grizzly Times, and I'm delighted to be here today with Bob Jackson. Bob worked as a backcountry ranger for Yellowstone Park for 30 years, and he became known as Action Jackson for his work that led to a record number of convictions of poachers in the park's remote southern area known as the Thoroughfare. Bob had lots of bear encounters, but he never even had to deploy bear spray. He's here today to share his experiences and thoughts on how today's skyrocketing hunter conflicts might be reduced. Bob, maybe you can start with how you came to be a ranger in Yellowstone, and what drew you to the company of grizzlies? My brothers and I all got uh, degrees in fish and wildlife biology from Iowa State. We grew up on a farm in northern Iowa, and in the yearbook, they'd put us down as a great white hunters um, for high school. Um, we trapped. We hunted. I wouldn't trap anymore because I know a lot more about it, but... Uh, so a lot of that experience was outdoors, maybe because there's five kids in the family and, you know, you actually have to get out of the house. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's how we started. And uh, I got, took a government test at the post office and got a job with the Bureau of Sport Fisheries in Yellowstone. Uh, and that's where I worked seasonally for three years, 1969 through 71. And then I realized that I was more of the ranger type than I was a biologist type. I didn't want to keep uh, looking at uh, fish scales under a microscope in the winter. So my brother was a lot better, than my one brother doing that than I was. So uh, combining what I did in the backcountry of uh, Yellowstone was the same thing except a lot better than what I grew up with, with uh, all the hunting, you know, there it was pheasants and things like this. But the outdoors was always what I wanted. And in the end, I traded uh, hunting game for hunting poachers, hunting hunters. So that's how I got into it. Bob, you had some significant success going after poachers, including some who were protected by powerful politicians like former Vice President Dick Cheney. Why were you so successful? Um, where I patrolled, especially the first years I was in the northwest section of the park, where the outfitters there uh, weren't quite as isolated. You still had all the problems. I'd ski on, you know, hunters, that, you know, outfitters and guys that would go in the park in the wintertime on the late hunt. And then on the fall, sheep patrol, um, and a lot of that was going on up there, too. Uh, but once you get into what you call horse country, down in the southern part, southeast corner of Yellowstone, it's all, you know, it's all horses. And it's all, there's kind of a lawless land. Uh, Forest Service kind of capitulated on patrolling that stuff decades before, you know, it was about over with in the 70s for them. And I guess, to me, the game wardens, which I would normally bond with, um, most of them, once they got in the back country from their front country patrol in Cody or Jackson Hole, they got to ride their horses. And so the culture was more of horse culture than it was identifying as law enforcement. One older time ranger told me, he says, well, we're a lot like the outfitters. We all ride horses. Well... That's like saying someone highway patrol, you know, yeah, we drive cars just like the people breaking the law. But uh, it was more important to be a part of that Old West type culture. And so the what I call the bad guys, the outlaws, you know, the mm-hmm. outfitters down in there, it was a lawless land. And they would have wars amongst themselves. And, of course, it was all... Uh, 
border raids is what they thought of it going into Yellowstone. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, they'd go in, you know, either opportunistic where they'd have the salt right outside the line, see big bulls right in there and they couldn't wait. And so they'd shoot them. And then um, when I went into thoroughfare, Originally, there was bones. You couldn't go a quarter mile without seeing bones a half mile in, quarter mile in. Um, Mm. And those were, they never caught anybody. Everybody could see what was happening, but to actually convict them. Or, you know, they always had stories. And so unless you really knew what you're doing, it was easier to believe the stories of the guys. But as far as the rangers go, yeah, they would intimidate them. Um, Like one ranger... They picked him up by the neck and Ooh. threw him to the ground. And, you know, the guys came right on wow. down into my country after that. And this ranger huh. never told me. It's just that I knew the, you know, the bad guys in this case. Um, and they said, yeah, you probably heard about what we did, but he did some bad things to us. And so, you know, those are the things that, you know, the rangers wouldn't even tell you what would happen to them. And so there's a lot of intimidation on the Forest Service side. If anybody wrote a ticket, most of the time the influential outfitters, um, you know, had enough political power that the mm-hmm. tickets would be ripped up once they got uh, into Jackson Hole headquarters. Mm-hmm. And so it was very demoralizing for any wilderness guards down there like at Hawks Rest in the 70s. I mean, the outfitters would be throwing stakes out and stuff to the camps, you know, out of the plains. Uh, they would be wow. dropping blocks of salt out of the plains. And it was all seen by Forest Service, but they were afraid to do anything about it. So the more you get of that, the more you have things that happen. Um, you know, when I started catching them, and they really, really hated that, and... You know, they poisoned my horses twice. They put porcupine wow. quills in the mules' roll spots, um, you know, where those things would eat right into the flesh if you yeah. didn't catch it. If they, you know, So you'd always have to check the roll spots at the cabins. So it was, yeah. in a way, it was kind of a, I hate to think of it that much, but it was kind of a war between myself and them. I, I wish it was something uh. different. You talk about how to make outfitters understand and... It, I guess you're going to have to uh, show what happens if they don't follow the law. You know, all those camps could be clean, but they're not. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. why aren't they? Why are they leaving the elk carcasses where the bears can get at them? You know, they know all, they all know what they need to do, but they're not going to because it's more important to be old wild west. And they really don't want to save any bear that I know of. They want to kill everyone. Anyway, that's a good start for what I think of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your work put you in close contact with a lot of grizzly bears, and it seems that sometimes you were surprised uh, by a bear when you were silently staking out a bust. What did you do to prevent and respond to the close encounters you had? Um, A lot of rangers wouldn't go off the trail. Um, If they went off, it was just right there at the boundary, and they'd maybe follow a blood trail a little ways, but... Everybody thinks of it as boundary patrol, and that's what, when I got into it, it was like, oh, yeah, you go to the boundary and you patrol, but you find out that there is no boundary. It's Hmm. the front lines is, it could be 12, 20 miles inside of Yellowstone, uh, because they were poaching all the way through. They'd come from the south boundary, you know, go along the other side of the river, of the Yellowstone, instead of where the trail was, and they'd go clear into the Southeast Army Yellowstone, and they'd do all the poaching on the resident herd that had the big, big bulls in there, you know, so there were camps, and so part of what I'd be doing in the summer was just finding where these guys would be poaching interior, Uh, you know, they'd all have little teeny campfires, they'd have areas where they'd tie their horses up, everything was horse, Um, so... You had to do a lot of off-trail, and when you're doing off-trail, then the bears don't suspect you as being there. And so mm-hmm. you surprise a bear real close in, and uh, that's when the wolf or, you know, the big noise or they're coming at you, that kind of stuff. And what you learn, of course, the horse horses helped out a lot uh, mm-hmm. being on a horse, but half the time you're walking your horse. 
you know, all those mountain men, you know, all the miles that I put on, 70,000 miles or whatever in 30 years, probably at least a third, maybe a half of that almost, is you're in front of your horse, just like you see the, the paintings of the mountain men leading their animal. Uh, for mm-hmm. one, your horse can't keep going that many miles each year. And then uh, for the other is, you know, you just you can't be safe. You can't do anything. But you do learn where you can go. There are times when, like, you're going to stay near a ridge. You're going to stay with some distance between you. And if you're in willows, uh, you know, like in the southeast arm, there's lots of willows. Mm-hmm. You're always making yeah. noise. You know, you're saying, here, boys. Here, bear, here, bear. You know, you don't want to surprise them is what it is in a situation, especially if you, like I say, you're off the trail. They have the foggiest idea that there's going to be someone there. And so mm-hmm. you surprise, and their defense is to come at something if you're within 25 feet. The ones where I couldn't do anything about that I lucked out on, basically, is if you heard shots, let's say up a drainage, maybe three, four, or five miles in the park, and you're riding by. And they're always really early evening or uh, late evening or early morning shooting is when they would do it. But then you're waiting in the dark, you know, for those mm-hmm. guys. And you knew the game trails. And so you would wait, and you'd tie your horse maybe a quarter mile away. Uh, my horse would never whinny, but their horses mm-hmm. might. And if that was so, then... You know, they'd have the, the they'd be tipped off, so to speak, and maybe a hundred yards from you, they'd be crashing through the woods. You wouldn't get them. So, you got to be by a game trail, and all at once, the you know, twenty feet from you, all at once, a big wolf. You know, you're behind a tree or a cliff, waiting for the bad guys because you're in a good spot. But that good spot means you're hidden even more. And so, if the wind was right, the bear could be really on you. So, that happened four times. Um, mm. That's where your scalp actually moves. You feel it move. And <laughs> oh, God. There, you know, you got a 50% chance. And so you could say I was lucky on two of those out of the four. But, um, you know, in those cases, you don't have time. You know, they talk in these reports, you don't have time to bring the gun up. Yeah, you don't. But most of the time, you're traveling thousands of miles in backcountry where it's their turf. And uh, I'm sure it wasn't any different than mountain men. You learn how to travel. And, uh, you know, in fact, that's why some of those smaller drainages in Yellowstone have never had a white man in them yet, except for me finding the big piles of Indian ships, because the bears is what keeps some of those areas out from those poachers. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of success um, going after poachers, and, uh, in fact, you were responsible for a record number of poaching arrests. some say more than all rangers combined for the last, like, 70 years or so. Um, some of those um, people involved were protected by powerful politicians, um, like the former Vice President Dick Cheney. Correct. Why were you so successful? And maybe you could share one case that you're especially proud of. Success is because of determination, and you're not going to let that happen. And I had the knowledge and the background and the drive to make it. You know, you don't think of horse culture. You don't think that, oh, I'm on a horse, you know, for all those miles. I'm part of the horse community. You don't really learn much from people that have the image of who they are. Just like if you have a ranger on Yellowstone Lake, and he wants to be that ranger because he likes riding a, you know, paddling a canoe or a kayak. Well, on your, if you're on your horse... It's there because of what you're wanting to try to do, not because you like to ride horses. And so all the Walter Mitty, the guides, the camp bosses in those camps, you know, you, you don't learn much. And they get tunnel vision as to whether they're with horses or when they're poaching. It's the image of who they are that's most important. So some of the poaching cases would seem like they were pretty tough to get, but... All you had to have is a lot of knowledge, and you let them break their stories down. You know, you could say the one case came in where there were uh, former guides for, you know, the friends of Dick Shaney, and they camped about four miles outside of where the outfitter camp was. There's no way that an outfitter doesn't know who's there, and he's going to kick them out. 
but they went in the park about four miles, shot an elk, took the cape and the skull plate out of it. I tracked them. What they do is they would leave tracks going in in a fairly easy place to see tracks. Everything back there is mm-hmm. tracks. Guides are tracks. Clients are tracks. Everybody, they look to rangers to see where their tracks are, uh, where the elk are tracks. Everything you do back there is tracking. And so they would leave, you know, like these two guys left, uh, you know, they had two horses, just riding horses that they went in because they weren't going to take any meat or anything. And then Uh they go into an area that's got a lot of dust, and then they turn around and they come back out. Anybody else thinks, oh, yeah, they were in the park, but then they came back out. Well, the next day they came right in over top of their old tracks, you know, the ones the day before. Then they went down some jagged rocks and little ledges where they had to jump their horses. I mean, as soon as you see that, you know they don't care about their animals. And so then you track them and track them. And yeah, I can track about two mile an hour. They can go three mile an hour. But uh, and that's on dry ground. But tracking isn't just tracking every track. It's leapfrogging, running the head on your horse to the end of the meadow to where they're going to go through trees, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You're trying to catch mm-hmm. them in Yellowstone. Uh, and if you go so fast that you see your horses tied up and you get too close, then like it's like oh crap, I got yeah. in too close. Yeah, because uh, they're close by then. So um, you know, in that case, you know, and they drug the elk out uh, from the meadow, and uh, they and we've got we got those for. Uh, I I didn't actually get those guys. Uh, they get, made it to the boundary, the border before. I did, but um, I had guys called ahead from the radio. I was up in high elevation so I could get ahead, and we did get them. Uh, And that one set the state record, uh, $20,000, I think it was, and they had to, you know, give up their horses and guns and saddles. And, of course, they ain't going to give up their saddle, so they say it got stolen. But uh, in the end, you get most of what they had, and so that set the state record. Bob, we first met in the late 1990s when you had become a lightning rod for the controversy over grizzly bears and the proposed removal of endangered species protections. That was partly because you were showing how vulnerable grizzly bears were, even in the national parks, where people assumed they were safe. So despite being initially proud of your success, the Park Service tried to get rid of you. Maybe you can share about what happened next and how you survived. As far as surviving, it had to do with people like you. You were the one that uh, t- got a hold of me because you'd start reading that stuff, I think, in the newspaper. And yeah. uh, you said, hey, there's a group out there, an organization, PEER, Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, yeah. that uh, can really help on something like this. And, and of course, everything, and that was almost a year into it, you know, everything I'd been, it was you pretty much do it on your own, you know. Every time you reach down to get a drink of water out of a stream, you you find out you're looking both ways, just like an animal, because that's when you're not safe. So you learn to live back there, you know, up to five months a year without even ever coming out. You know, there's you no know, electricity, you know. Most of the time you don't have radio reception. And so you think you can handle everything. Uh, but this was bigger than me in the end, you know, you know just because you do good. Yeah. And you think, well, that's going to be the end thing. You know, doing good a lot of times doesn't really, when you're working with the government. And yeah. so you had the influential um, outfit. And, you know, that's sort of the status thing. If you're a Western senator or whatever, you know, you see these guys like uh, the guy up in Montana now. He's head of the Department of Interior, Zinke or whatever. You mm-hmm. know, they got their cowboy yeah. hat and they ride their cowboy you know, outfit into the capital. You know, that's like the status thing. Right. And so right. it's more important for them to maintain that. So, you know, it's just that people are trying to, they're all this whole water midi life. You know, they're the life of what was a horseman before, you know, in the 1800s isn't mm-hmm. the same. So you get the glorified image. And, of course, that's what the guides and the outfitters and your senators, they're trying to live on that. And they're feeding off right. of it, you know, with the public. You know, how you get by with something with that in a world that's fake, 
And, you know, you got peer, you got yourself, you got uh, pretty much the environmental groups, your Greater Yellowstone Coalition, you got your Jackson Hole Alliance, and -hmm. those are your support systems, actually, you find out, because you actually have to enter into the real world, even though I was back there all that time. And so it was that support system, along with my Senator Grassley, that allowed them to actually fight it successfully. Um, You know, even if you're, you know, the reporters were all for me. You know, it was whether it was in the United States or British Broadcasting Company, um, they they were all for me. And so all the articles were really a lot more supportive than the other side, um, you know, that was trying to make me out as a beg ranger or whatever. They uh, So right. that worked really well, but they still have the the, the, the final hand. Uh, they're the one that can say, well, we'll take this case up, and the government, usually you have a backlog of five years. Well, Senator Grassley is the one that put it to the front. And so uh, he got the Office of Special Counsel and then whatever their allies were, um, you know, in this case of mine where they're trying to get me out of there. Um, yeah. You know, then everybody that was doing the lion, the district rangers, the chief rangers, whatever, because most of the administrators, it was career was more important, whether it's forest service, park service, game and fish, or whatever, than actually doing what they were signed up to do. And so, uh, you know, in the end, Shaney he hated it. And so, <laughs> when I got vindicated and got to go back to the same place as always which you never do, even if you win. They always assign yeah. you somewhere else. But I got to do it. And so he did the hatchet job. You know, the head of public affairs had to take early retirement. You know, my uh, mm. one of my supervisors got demoted. Um, wow. You know, there's uh, about four or five people, you know, early retirement for the head investigative ranger put in charge of it. They had to transfer huh. to the Forest Service, which is kind of like going to the pig farm. If you're park service, <laughs> um, so well that's Department of Agriculture Forest Services to what in, in our or park service thinks of it as. So uh, yeah. anyway, that's what that's what it was. Um, you know, I guess I had the advantage of a lot of other rangers. I had the farm, I had my three four hundred yeah. buffalo, and uh, what yeah. are they going to do? Send me to the farm? I mean, I liked it anyway doing that. <laughs> Bob, as you know, hunter conflicts are mounting. Here's one report among many that maybe you could share your thoughts about that occurred south of Yellowstone Park. It involved a hunting guide and camp worker who attempted to retrieve an elk that had been shot earlier in the day. When they returned, they found the carcass had been pulled by a grizzly bear to the edge of a meadow. They proceeded to watch five grizzly bears that had been drawn to the meat. And then they shot into the air to try to scare off the bears and started field dressing the elk. And after yelling and throwing rocks at one grizzly bear that neared the carcass, they shot and killed it. The group's canister of bear spray was in a backpack by their horses. Government attorneys later declined to press charges saying the killing was in self-defense. What would you have done differently here? Um, A lot different, of course. And it's really good that you bring that case up because it really shows how bad the situation is back there. You know, they have four or five different bears, you know, boars and sows with cubs and radio collared, all different ones. I mean, that's a huge thing where um, you're going to have bears killing bears. Uh, and that. So they're, they're extremely habituated bears. Um, a lot of those bears are the same ones that are in Yellowstone in the summer because they leave Yellowstone and they go outside the park in the fall because of all the big carcasses that are now there. You know, there's so much meat left um, now compared to what it used to be. It used to be full quarters taken out. A gut pile doesn't have really anything there that has enough on it for a bear to discover and eat. You know, your ravens, your eagles, your coyotes are going to get to the organ meat. You know, there's not much left on a full quartered animal. So all the hunter or the guides and the outfitters, they've switched to at the best quick quartering where they're leaving huge mm-hmm. amounts of meat. You know, they're popping off a front and hind quarter. You know, all the neck muscle is left, all, everything on the ribs. You know, you got maybe 50 to 75 pounds of meat. 
And so that means that bears are going to be coming in. But these bears, they're not really causing a problem in Yellowstone. So why are they causing a problem outside? You know, mm-hmm. you know, people go all over in Yellowstone, a lot of hiking, off trail, on trail, you know, and they tourists, backpackers, you know. So why are they all coming here? It's, it's no different than the campgrounds when I first went to Yellowstone and, you know, after the bars would close um, and all of us youngins, the nurses and us would get in the cars and you go to Bridge Bay Campground, you go to Fishing Bridge, you know, you go out to Pelican Creek Campground, all those, um, you can see grizzlies, you know, every night, every time you go out there. It's better than going to the drive-in movies. Um, but <laughs> then, of course, they closed the dumps and all months of priority was to you know, get that food source there, and so all the, you know, the ranger cars would go by with their loudspeakers every night before dark, saying all ice chests must be, you know, inside, all food, off the picnic tables. And within a year or two, there was no more bears in there. So mm-hmm. they know what they're doing wrong, the outfitters are, why the bears are coming in. I think in that case you're talking about, they had a 4570 that may have been one where they had the 357 and the 44, you know, or yeah. it could have been the one where they had the shotgun. But anytime you got a 4570 rifle, that's a lever action. That's what I carried. You know, that's a bear gun or a human gun. That's not a. You're not using that gun for elk. It doesn't have the range in the mountains you need to have. So, you know, in a shotgun, you know, they're there. The priority is. That gun is for the bear. If those guys are coming in and they're going in on an elk, they already know it's so bad that they have to take a gun like that along with them instead of their regular hunting stuff. You know, everyone's going to have the 44 on the hip. You know, I don't even know why they had a 357. I mean, you put that gun in a bear's ear and shoot it if it's on top of your buddy. That's about the only thing. That just causes wounded bears, which then are really problem bears. Bob, as you know, whitebark pine forests have collapsed due to an unprecedented climate-driven outbreak of mountain pine beetles. With the loss of whitebark pine seeds, grizzly bears are increasingly seeking out elk, which means more conflicts with hunters. What are your suggestions, and are you optimistic that hunters can make peace with bears? Uh, The whitebark pine is always going to be a problem now. Uh, I don't know when it's going to change, you know, warm climate. You know, mm-hmm. when I used to ski, and, uh, well, I'd ski that late hunt on the Gallatin, and mm-hmm. it would sometimes be 40 below. You have to be in snowshoes. Um, right. Yeah, I don't think they see any of the 40 below. You know, at West Yellowstone there in the winter, we had, I don't know, 12 out of 14 days that were 50 below or, or colder. It got down to 63 below uh, one winter. You know, that's what, I guess, keeps the pine bark beetles, and I don't think yeah. they're having that anymore no they got we're so not each year and... i was going into yellowstone there was less and less snow and less and less runoff you know the more years the decades i got in there so it was mm-hmm. happening you know from the 80s and 90s to you know early 2000s where there's getting a mm-hmm. difference there and so now it's even a lot worse i guess so i don't know what the answer is there i do know you get the food source away whether it's yellowstone and the example for all the hunter and community it's just do what they did in Yellowstone, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. But the camps don't want it, so it's going to have to be the enforcement in those camps. And, of course, there is no one there. There's no one around. Right. You know, if you're, yeah. you know, Yellowstone Park and you got budget, you know, you get your front country patrol, you know, then what's the easy one to take out? You know, I had one yeah. sub-district ranger after I'd caught a couple different poachers that year, and, you know, and he was about ready to retire, and he said to me, what difference does it make if you catch if you catch a poacher, you know, and you got one or two elk, you know? What difference does that make in a herd of 10,000? Well, if you got that attitude, you know, all at once things get a lot worse and the complications and how it extends to with all these bears being killed. I mean, the bears is what makes life. I mean, yeah, I was, yeah. I always had to think of bears. Every night you bang on the door before you go out in case there's a bear right on right. the porch there, you know? You're yelling, yeah. you know, here, bear, when you're going to the outhouse. You know, you got your flashlight. You're ready to go. But, you know, that's where you, the humbleness comes in. You're not top dog, you know. 
the bear is what's really needed to be around. And everybody thinks great of it, you know, first-person accounts in outdoor life, but they still want to kill them all, you know. Why do you want to kill them, you know? But the outfitters aren't going to change. Um, It's going to have to be the outside influence, and it'll have to be the rewards, you know. I think Mm -hmm. whether there's a $50,000, $50,000 reward for a, you know, all those guides, you know, they all want a new pickup, you know. If they can squeal on another guide or an outfitter they had a war with or whatever, then Mm -hmm. they're going to tell. Let's say that you got fresh salts, you know, give give somebody a thousand bucks to identify the salts, you know, where the elk are congregating, where the bears are congregating. Um, you know, give them a thousand bucks for every confirmed, you know, pre, you know, present salt. You know, up yeah. to five five thousand dollars. You know, heck, you're going to have former guides tell them where all the salts are. You know, yeah. so, it, but it'll take. You know, it'll be like Forest Service. You say, hey. If we have proof that we got present salts here going on that are congregating the elk, are you going to do anything about it? You know, put the accountability onto them, you know, because mm-hmm. they're the ones that don't want to do anything. It's the agencies that are the problem right now. Yeah. Well, the agencies have also taken a hard look over decades on the conflicts and mortalities associated with grizzly bears, and law enforcement comes up time and time again as the highest among the highest recommendations. Uh, in, additional law enforcement in the backcountry, additional prosecution of, of cases, investigation and prosecution of cases, and yet law enforcement is not happening. It, it's a lot less than your days, so clearly that needs to be turned around. Well, if it's efficient law enforcement, whether it was yeah. game wardens or whether it was rangers back there, they always had a presence every fall, all fall in thoroughfare. But everybody goes, the culture means you ride the boundary, then you go to the outfitter camp and you have hot cherry pie and you talk all all this stuff on horses, you talk all this culture stuff. And the game wardens, you know, they may have four horses or three horses in their pastures out by Cody, you know, that's assigned to them. And they go mm-hmm. in the back country for a 10-day trip in the fall, and they go into the camps and eat hot cherry pie and talk horse stories and bears, and they talk elk. You know, it's a way that they get away from the regular duties. And mm-hmm. I never saw anything with law enforcement that actually helped out that much. Uh, the culture is what's got to change. You know, you could have yeah. the guys, or you can have the snow job stories. And if 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 the ranger doesn't want to know what's really mm-hmm. happening, all those stories that I see in the papers, like the one you talked about, you know, you could write a whole book on each one of those incidents yeah. and say, why is the reason? Why did that happen? You know, that's how I get all the poachers. You let them go through their stories, and you break them down, and they all cry. You know, and they're broken <laughs> down. Then you get the confessions, but you, you got to want to do it. And I don't see anything in Game and Fish where they're wanting to do it. They think of of grizzly bears as taken away from their time. If they have to yeah. deal with something out by Pahaska Teepee or the North Fork or the Shoshone or the South Fork, they don't like it. Uh, just like they didn't yeah. like the fires of Yellowstone. They'd report all these elk that were being trapped because they'd go up behind Pahaska and they'd see all these bones and powdered and... You know, those are elk that had died in the winter time. That wasn't something yeah. died in a in a forest fire, but they're all put in there because they didn't like forest fire. They didn't like grizzly bears. They talk yeah. about them. So, I guess I'm a little cynical as to what law enforcement. It will help to have law enforcement. Yeah. Because you might have some outfitter that's worn with another outfitter, and mm-hmm. he's going to tell about how this guy shot this grizzly bear. You might have that kind of success, but as far as actually, you know, what game warden? I mean, I've had a number of different game wardens come in where a grizzly was shot, and they go, oh, yeah, went into the woods, you know, because they never find the carcass because they don't want to go in the woods because then the bear can get them. So what are they going to do, you know? You know, so they're not wanting to see it happen. So law enforcement is important, but it'll be kind of a, you know, not the primary thing of why they even get yeah. anything. But there are things right. that can be done, you know, like all the hunters. 
you know, be, they're all going to come in the forest service or wilderness areas. Everybody knows who those hunters are before they ever even get to, you know, the southeast corner or the Gallatin or anything else. The identity uh-huh. has to be with them, with the government, before they ever get there because they're so vulnerable. Uh, you know, they're just like an abused person long term. They're they don't have any way out of that back country. They're all dependent on that outfitter to get them out of there. Mm-hmm. So they're like little yeah. kids in there. So the identity has to be with um, the government. I mean, I went on one case where actually you were running the horses because they were running on foot, and the guy turned out to be a deputy sheriff out of Maine, and oh. they were about a half mile in Yellowstone, and they, they all, once the guide's running, I see him at the end of the meadow, you flip the lead rope over the pack horse, and you, you, you pull till the head. And, you know, the guy told me later after we tracked him and got him down, and he says, I saw you guys coming, and I thought you were outlaws. I mean, that's their that's their impression. They, right, they still the Wild think West. It. Yeah, it's the Wild West. I thought you guys were outlaws. And this was a deputy sheriff out of Maine, you know, because uh-huh. he saw the guide running, you know. Um, huh. I thought you were outlaws. So you get you got to get to the hunter before they get to the mountains. Yeah. And then you have to have the signs at the trailheads, you know, uh-huh. saying... You know, some of the stuff that identifies the government there. And then you uh-huh. have to have areas, you know, like uh, wherever you have a, an active salt, then there has to be signs around it saying no hunting here within a quarter of a mile because that's uh-huh. hunting over bait. And that's something game yeah. and fish. If you prove that, then yeah. every hunter sees this. You know, no hunting over this location, you know, and with a, with a, a phone number that they can get a hold of. You know, so you have the presence, even though you may not have law enforcement back there that much, you still have the identity uh, with that hunter. And the hunter is going to be your best one to tell things what's happening, you know. Right. It shouldn't be just me having to track people down. But I never yeah. had a, a hunter ever squeal on his outfitter. You're not going huh. to, you know, because they got to right. get out of there. So yeah. they're not going to tell anything, you know. Yeah. So anyway, those are... What I think needs to be done, they can do it real mm-hmm. easily. And the Forest Service and the Game and Fish won't even know what they what they approved. They won't even know what they did. But the outfitter, huh. he thinks of that as his land. That's his land. Yeah. That's his turf. That's his ranch. He can do anything he wants. What he has wars with is the other outfitter, you know. The culture is what's got to change. And as far as optimistic, no, you're not going to change it. It's just... The enforcement on it, you know, where the penalties yeah. are there, like up in Alaska, right. if you're doing something wrong like that. But you, for first off, they got to get full quarters out of there, just like they used yeah. to do. Everybody used to do, and they got to get it out immediately. And if they don't have room to do it, they leave the, you know, they leave the the rack and the skull plate. They can put that up in a tree, you know, throw a rope mm-hmm. over, get that out of the way. It's real light, and then they can come back to it. But everybody takes the skull plate and the rack first, and then they come back for the meat. You know, mm-hmm. they got so many horses in camp. They can take the the pack horses with them, just like any private rancher that would used to hunt up there. They can do mm-hmm. it, but they don't want to do it, you know. Mm-hmm. And as far as the way that they hang their elk, you know, all these uh, bears that are coming around camp, if, if there isn't food there, they don't come around. Whether they can yeah. smell the elk carcass or not, it isn't like they're panic hungry. It's because they're getting results, just like Bridge Bay Campground, right. you know, where they had all the ice chests. So yeah. then you can start seeing. And so I'd say before you ever try to delist, you say, hey, those camps have got to be cleaned up, you know. they got to yeah. take full quarters. Then we yeah. can start thinking about delisting. That's what I'd say. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Bob. I uh, really appreciate it. This, uh, we're here today with Bob Jackson. This is Louisa Wilcox with Grizzly Times. Thank you so much. <laughs>